A very good morning to all of you. My name is Riya Srivastav and I welcome you all to the 23rd edition of the World Sustainable Development Summit, India's premier platform for deliberating the discourse around sustainability and climate change. On behalf of Terry, it is my pleasure to MC this plenary session on financing sustainable development and climate action, a crucial topic that holds the key to our shared future. To begin with, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists for this session. Our esteemed chair of the session is Mr. Deepak Das Gupta, distinguished fellow of Terry. Let's give a round of applause to welcome him. We have Ms. Dr. Uh, Amar Bhattacharya, senior, senior fellow, Brookings Institution and Grantham Research Institute, London School of Economics. We also have Ms. Priya Shankar, India Director, Climate and Environment Program, Bloomberg Philanthropies. Please also join me in welcoming Ms. Pamela Juven, Director, SME Climate Hub, We Mean Business Coalition. Moving on, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Her Excellency, Ms. Teresa Rivera Rodriguez, Minister, Ministry for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge, Spain, for a ministerial address. Please, ma'am. Good morning. Everybody, I'm so happy to, to be here. To be here again, I could say, because it's been a long time since um, I um, came to this uh, World Sustainable Development uh, Summit in, in Delhi. I guess that uh, the last time I participated in this event was in 2010, so a long, a long time ago, and many things have happened. And, um, I would like to start by uh, expressing my gratitude and admiration for this event happen, happening every year. I think that um, it shows to what extent it is important to keep on discussing, finding the ways forward into something which is challenging for all of us, but that deserves our attention and our efforts to identify how we can solve some of the questions, some of the pressing questions of uh, today's world. This um, celebration of your 50th anniversary is um, quite, uh, quite a relevant event in terms of um, how intense and how uh, worth is the effort. Today has become a season institution combining wisdom and innovation capacities to provide answers and to provide question marks, question marks that uh, matter to all of us. And um, I think that um, you have um, introduced this subject for today's discussion, which um, is increasingly relevant, how we can respond to what we already agreed to do in Paris a long time ago, but that we probably knew far before Paris, we should aim um, to get all the financial flows all over the world being climate compatible. So to address the problems, to reduce the, the source of the problems, but also to ensure that we can count on sustainable development, welfare for all, taking into consideration the need to build resilience against climate change impacts and to ensure prosperity, wealth for any human being in a peaceful and prosperous future. According to the Climate Policy Initiative, and we will be hearing about it in a while, climate finance global flows nearly doubled last year. And this is good news. But it is still far away from being enough. It is still far away from being able to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. We need to rapidly increase the financial flows dedicated to these efforts. 
A closer look at the numbers also reveals information we need to be mindful about. For instance, the growth in climate finance flows is unevenly distributed among sectors and among regions and countries, even among social groups. Largely concentrated in clean energy investments in a handful of countries and regions that uh, do not take into consideration the pressing needs of many other countries and regions. Thank you so much. There is a major progress in climate vulnerable countries where investments are urgently needed for adaptation, for reducing the vulnerability and fragility of the societies. We witness a growing inequality in investment and deployment of renewable energy between the global north and the global south. And we identify private finance growing, but not at the rates and scale at the level of consistency that we require, especially not in developing countries, but not only. And this is not just a matter of numbers. The challenges in mobilizing climate finance also have to do with finding the right instruments to do so, the right incentives, the right signals. The easy way to dedicate our efforts, there were, they are needed. For instance, we cannot expect climate vulnerable and fiscally constrained developing countries to have recourse to credit instruments to accelerate mitigation and adaptation actions. We need to find ways to close the widening climate adaptation gap. And of course, it will require direct public financing, but also making the economic case for an early adaptation everywhere and from any single player. The recent succession crisis, successive crises, are impacting on global financial flows, um, raising the issue on how much we can ensure that what it is committed to do takes place. The impact of the COVID pandemic shows the difficulties, but also the need to respond as soon as possible to global challenges and to do it in a common cooperative manner. The food crisis and the energy crisis in some parts of the world connected to the Ukrainian war or the question marks on what it may happen what, when we see what it is happening in Gaza may also raise questions on whether we dedicate the resources towards climate action or whether we distract resources from what we should be dedicating them. The struggle to cope with debt costs continue to rise due to the soaring price of money. And still, there is a deep conversation on how we could update the way we govern, we take decisions, over the Bretton Goods institutes, institutions. Sorry. The debt burden has led to a shrinking fiscal space in fragile economies that can hardly finance basic public services let alone invest in the climate action they need to build climate resilience and tap new development opportunities. And in this context, development finance should play a key role, and it is critical to ensure that they retrofit in a positive manner one to the other. So development finance, climate finance, should be consistent and should be maximizing the positive effects of the investment decisions. Mainstream and green agendas taking into consideration social needs, social concerns, boost opportunities in the economic fields. The development strategies and climate proofing of all ODA is a must. Development and climate policies cannot operate in silos. We need to draw linkages and tap on synergies to advance global prosperity. This is why I think it is also quite a good news to be able to count on Terry's Act for Earth initiative launched last year. This also shows many opportunities to be explored and to be promoted at many different levels. From COP negotiations and SDGs work, we identify how we should be encouraging outcome-based continuity on these concerns. This will also be the case for a um, the work we need to develop on the next United Nations Global Conference on Finance for Sustainability to be held in Spain during this year. 
As climate change impacts accelerate, public funds, national and internationally mobilized, need to be directed to climate adaptation. We need to protect population, public infrastructure and assets, and prevent further aggravation of development challenges. But public budgets alone will never be enough to address the persistent development challenges and the unfolding triple environmental crisis. This should bring us into a deeper discussion on how to ensure that no single private pen or cent is dedicated in a way that could create additional harbors. Despite the challenges and the daunting task to mobilize trillions, the longer we delay meeting climate investment needs, the higher the cost will be. And yes, we should be talking about carbon pricing. We should be talking about development banks. But we should be having a much more deeper conversation on how we ensure, as I said, that all financial flows, as promised in Paris, could be increasingly consistent with climate action. We need to mobilize trillions, and we also need a change, a change of mindset. And this is still not on track. An innovative approach to ensure that all financial flows are aligned encompasses at least shifting public funding and aligning private funds to green investments, taking into consideration social concerns when talking and when deciding on green investments, identifying new sources of finance, global taxation to polluting activities may be a case to study and to promote the efficient use of carbon markets could help the credit guarantees to ensure the rapid growth in what it is required for development and access for access to fresh water onto energy is a must the blending of finance the debt traps the weather insurance are some of the elements some of the tools that we need to build on creating positive enabling environments in countries to attract investment is also a requirement. Reforms in the international financial sector, including the MDBs, to align its purpose, tools, and strategies for the protection of global public goods, such as climate, is a must. And let me shed some light on recent progress made in some of these fronts. Starting by the progress signal at COP28. The global stock take decision resulting from this COP acknowledges things that are quite important to provide signals to both public and private players. First, the stress to need to phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. It's not something to be taken from one day to the other, but it has to take place. Of course, taking into consideration the social requirements for just transition purposes or to provide comfort to the most vulnerable communities. The importance to reform the multilateral financial architecture and align investments with the Paris Agreement is also part of the decision. And this will be one of the challenges along the year. The need for enhanced transparency and management of climate-related financial risk to scale down harmful activities and scale up access to finance for green projects is ongoing. And some of these issues, together with the next commitment dealing with climate finance, will be part of the Bacchus discussion next year, this year, by the end of this year in COP29. The rapid initial capitalization of the loss and damage fund is promising, but it is still far away from what we need. It should be read as a commitment by the developed countries to provide financial support to the most vulnerable countries, but still, much needs to be done. The fact that the United Arab Emirates committed a $100 million for this initial capitalization is also an example on how the debate on the provision of climate finance becomes larger and innovative. It is evolving, further opening the door to enlarging the donor base, or at least moving away from the assumption of a very a, um, a, a traditional way to understand what climate finance means. The European Union member states are leading the contribution of development assistance and the climate finance, providing around one third of the world's public climate finance. And still, it's not enough. We will continue to do our part. This is undoubtful. undoubtful. Commitment towards the negotiations for the new quantified collective goal 
have already started. We need to build progress on what we already agreed in the Paris Summer Summit for a new global finance pact. But uh, when we take a look on adaptation, we identify the difficulties to raise the bar on adaptation finance. The EU is committed to be at the forefront of the collective effort to scale up its provision and mobilization with a specific focus on poor and vulnerable countries and communities, particularly LDCs and SEEDs. But still, adaptation should be taking place everywhere in every sector and taking into consideration every local specificity. The Bridgetown agenda and ongoing debates on the reform of international financial architecture are promising with the potential to raise lending ambition of MDBs, according to Nicholas Stern's independent um, expert group on climate finance review. The independent um, high-level expert group, part of the existing financing gap may be filled with the existing capital while maintaining credit quality. Brokering innovative finance instruments, creating structures that facilitate the risk in fostering a conducive environment to crowd in private investors could be crucial. And to this aim, blending instruments may have a very important role to play. So let me end my remarks on this positive note. I'm sure that this is going to be a very, very, very passionate year. It won't be the last one. But this will be the year when we need to dedicate a great share of our common efforts to identify how to quickly move from the traditional way to understand climate finance towards something that it is much more meaningful, comprehensive, and cross-cutting. And I think that the ambition, the demand, and the capacity are there. Thank you so much. Our gratitude, Minister Rodriguez, for your insightful address. We have a special video message from our next speaker, His Excellency, Mr. Andreas Bjelland Eriksson, Minister, Ministry of Climate and Environment, Norway. Please join me in welcoming him for our next ministerial address. I request the AV team to please play the video. Dear distinguished guests, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to speak to you at the World Sustainable Development Summit. Climate finance is key if we are going to achieve our targets as set in the Paris Agreement. And all of us need to do our part. Norway has set an ambitious target in Glasgow of doubling our climate finance by 2026. And I am proud to state that this goal is already met three years ahead of time. We are also working hard to achieve our target of tripling adaptation finance going forward. This is done by several of the important initiatives that Norway is a part of. First, we have increased our national finance for the climate and forest initiative internationally from three to four billion Norwegian kroners from 2023 to 2024. Second, we have established a guarantee mechanism for investments in renewable energy, mobilizing private capital through a guarantee mechanism of five billion Norwegian kroners. Thirdly, our climate investment fund, where India is an important and prioritized country for Norway, where we have investment, uh, invested 180 million US dollars in, for example, solar, in transmission, and in agricultural waste to energy plants. We need to do even more going forward if we are to achieve our targets. I look forward to the global discussion on the future climate finance goal and Norway is going to contribute to that and be an important partner for all countries such as India going forward so that we can achieve the great transition targets that we have set and help together 
to bring a positive world, to bring sustainability and final climate uh, transition on the agenda also going forward. Thank you. We thank Minister Eriksson for uh, this enlightening address. Before we move on, a sincere apology on my end. I missed out two key speakers who are here with us on the dais. Uh, we welcome Dr. Dhruva Purkayastha, India Director, Climate Policy Initiative. Please give a warm round of applause for him and apologies from my end. And of course, we have our leader with, here, uh, with us here. Uh, and I also request Mr. Martin Razor, Vice President for South Asia Region, the World Bank, to also deliver his leadership address. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great if you uh, miss the first round of introduction, you get a special applause in the second round. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, to address the Sustainable Finance Summit, but also, I understand, speak on the occasion of Terry's 50th anniversary, uh, a very special occasion, I think, for a partner with whom the World Bank has a long uh, and, and, and very fruitful association, for which I want to thank you. There's no better place than India today to talk about sustainable development finance. In the limited time that I have, I want to address three dimensions of this very vast agenda. The first is growth and emissions, the second is climate adaptation, and the third is financing the transition to a green, sustainable development model. India's development record is impressive. It grew sixfold in the past two decades, living just, lifting just shy of 300 million people out of poverty. India's carbon emissions record is not bad either. Although India has, carbon emissions, has seen carbon emissions grow rapidly as average incomes have increased on a per capita basis, India today emits only 2.8 tons of CO2 per year a quarter of China's, one-sixth of the US, and less than half of the global average. India, I would argue, is likely to continue on this high-growth, modest emissions path for two reasons. First, because it's, it remains an economy driven by low emission services, even if demand for industrial goods is likely to increase as India urbanizes and builds more infrastructure to service a fast-growing economy, and second, because technological progress will allow India to increasingly decouple energy supply from carbon emissions. India has already made significant inroads in the power sector. It's currently the world's fourth largest renewables market, home to 3% of the global manufacturing capabilities. In addition, in five years, India has consistently invested close to $10 billion every year into renewables and ranks among the world's five emerging mid-income countries with the largest public investment in renewable energy. Now, I'm sure um, our colleagues will argue it's not enough, but it is a start. India's industrial sector is more challenging to decarbonize, and hence we project that industry alone will account for 50% 50, 50 of India's carbon emissions by 2050. But here too, building on the success in renewable energy, India's policy could further encourage investments in green technologies to decarbonize its industrial sector to advance towards net zero. In the short term, industrial decarbonization should be driven by energy efficiency and electrification where possible. Over the medium term, green hydrogen and carbon capture utilization and storage technologies will have to play a critical role if we are going to get to net zero. The right policies could help accelerate India's energy transition and the power sector, the reform of the distribution companies is probably the most urgent. But to encourage the deployment of new technologies, performance-based incentives could also be used. Smart procurement policies and offtake agreements can further invest, uh, incentivize investments at scale, as recently demonstrated, for example, for e-buses and similar offtake uh, regulations are currently being drafted for green hydrogen. With the right policies, India's energy transition is an investment opportunity and should be able to attract commercial financing. 
Now, if mitigation is India's opportunity, climate adaptation is India's imperative. India is among the top 10 most climate vulnerable countries globally. Planning for climate resilience is therefore essential. But here too, investment opportunities can be found. One example is urban cooling. India launched a cooling action plan in 2019, the first initiative of its kind globally. We estimate that the market for affordable cooling solutions in India represents a 1.6 trillion US dollar investment opportunity. Importantly, nature-based solutions such as passive design can generate cooling benefits and cut energy consumption. Taking into account the substantial health and productivity benefits, urban cooling investments generate what we call triple dividends, economic, social, and environmental returns. Searching for such triple dividends will be key to financing India's sustainable development. Two more examples, mangroves, seabed grass, and salt marshes have substantial potential for carbon storage while protecting coastal communities from climate disasters, supporting fisheries, and promoting tourism and jobs. And likewise, investments in air quality management can yield huge health benefits, supporting productivity whilst reducing carbon emissions. The increases in asset values associated with safer, cleaner, and more livable cities can be leveraged to mobilize private investment and complement limited public funding. More research is needed to find similar solutions in agriculture and food systems, both highly vulnerable to climate change and significant future emitters. Public resources alone cannot meet the financing needs of achieving development on a livable planet. Private capital and climate finance must be leveraged more efficiently. India's renewable energy expansion has predominantly relied on private investment thanks to appropriate regulatory policies and is likely to continue to do so. India's also made progress in carbon pricing with the introduction last year of the carbon credit trading scheme and the green credit program. While the caps in the schemes are, far, are so far not highly binding, the program nonetheless lays the foundation for blended finance solutions that combine private investment, public funds, and carbon finance. In adaptation, green, blue, and sustainability-linked bonds and other forms of impact investment could complement insurance and other commercial risk mitigation tools to drive sustainable development finance. Let me conclude. India's development trajectory matters globally. Its track record today puts it on a much lower carbon emissions path than other major economies before it. Its climate vulnerability, deep domestic capital markets, and its domestic innovation capacity may also position it as a leader in developing and funding cl smart climate adaptation. India's international partners, including the multilateral development banks, have the responsibility to support these efforts. Following the call of India's G20 presidency, we at the World Bank are revamping our operating model to be fit for this important goal. Globally, we have committed to reach 45% climate co-benefits in our financing, half of which will be an adaptation. And India this year is likely to exceed this goal. We look forward to our continued partnership with the authorities at the union and state level and with all of you in helping India realize its ambitious goals of reaching high income by 2047 and net zero emissions by 2070. Thank you very much for this opportunity and for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Razor, for your invaluable insights. I now request Mr. Das Gupta to share his opening remarks and take the session forward. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mike? Okay. All right. I have to something. So, thank you for those three excellent introductions to the topic 
uh, in the morning. Starting a morning with finance is not necessarily the most thrilling way to begin this, but it actually is an extremely important moment to talk about finance to begin this discussion and this three-day conference on sustainable development. And I'll tell you why. I think the, I, I will hear Amar Bhattacharya speak first about both the, uh, both the challenges and the opportunities uh, we, we are going to hear uh, Priya talk a little bit about what is going on on the philanthropy side. Lots of exciting things happening from the Bloomberg. She'll be from Bloomberg talking about that. Pamela will talk here about uh, SMEs and uh, what's happening on We Mean Business. And Dhruva will also join us a little bit, perhaps giving us some news about what climate policy CPI has been covering on the doubling of climate finance over the last year. So we are, in fact, at a moment we, we see enormous potentials, things that, uh, you know, I've been in this business since 2015 or before, and every year it was, a, uh, it was a tough job because the gap between where we needed to be and where we are were at, on finance was so big that it seemed impossible. Suddenly, things have changed and I think for the right uh, direction. We are seeing uh, uh, the scale up of finance happening dramatically not, and I think there's a general sense from the, uh, the three discussions we had this morning. Uh, thank you so much for giving us a sense that we are in fact in a, in, in a zone where all of us are committed to. So Amar, over to you. Um, thank you Deepak, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so, a real privilege to be here again at this summit, which has become a signature event, and particularly, uh, you know, to be here at the 50th anniversary of Terry, a, a, a real signature institution for the world and for India. Um, I'm going to speak from the perspective of the independent high-level expert group on climate finance, of which uh, Nick Stern and Vera Song were the co-chairs and I was the executive secretary and lead author of the report. So that's the perspective I, I bring, but in order to do that, I have to be very telegraphic, so bear with me. So we all know that this was the year where we took stock of the Paris Agreement, the five-year review, the global stock take, and the global stock take, you know, after a lot of del deliberation, came out with what we already knew, that climate change and its impacts were accelerating, and the action that was necessary was lagging and the time for remedial action was rapidly shrinking. So when we talk about finance, it is finance for that purpose, to close the ambition gap and to close the action gap. So the reason for the failure of delivery is underinvestment. Underinvestment in the transition to the low carbon economy, underinvestment as both Minister uh, uh, Rodriguez and Martin talked about in adaptation and resilience and underinvestment in nature and biodiversity. And this underinvestment is particularly acute in the developing world. Over the last seven years, notwithstanding the progress we heard about India, only 7% of the clean energy investment went was in emerging markets and developing countries, other than China, notwithstanding the fact that these countries will soon account for 50% of world emissions and more. So we are massively underinvesting in the opportunity of clean energy transition. The gap on adaptation and resilience is there. I come from, I live in the United States, and you can see that evidently in the US, but it is especially acute, and the impacts are especially concentrated, as Martin pointed out, in the developing world. And finally, on nature, 90% of the natural capital that we have to protect is in the developing world. 80% of the expenditure is in the rich world. So that's the starting point. But on the other side, we know that the needs are very large. We know, as Martin said, the imperative is very great. Just how great? We estimate that we will need to increase climate investment, and I always emphasize investment, that leads finance, fourfold from where we are spending now to about 2.4 trillion per year by 2030. 
about one and a half trillion of that is in the energy transition and, uh, and about 900 uh, uh, billion in uh, uh, adaptation, resilience, loss and damage and in natural capital. So where is that money going to come from? I mean, we all know that we have been obsessed with the 100 billion and I just put what we need to achieve in the context of the 100 billion. It's very good news that the 100 billion we is now being delivered. Uh, we have done our assessment. We believe that it has been met in 2020, maybe even in 2022. But that we know is clearly not going to be enough. But it's not the magnitude that we should focus on. We actually need a new system of finance that is fit for purpose, as the minister pointed out. This is about building and aligning all finance with the objectives in hand, which is sustainable development and climate action. In that context, you know, the bulk of the financing will have to come from domestic resources. And we know there is great scope for pricing the bad, carbon pricing. We know there is great uh, scope for eliminating harmful subsidies. And yes, we have to act on the issues of debt, on fiscal space and fiscal sustainability, and on improving domestic resources, including through domestic financial markets. Second, the private sector's role will be key. Of, of this total amount that I mentioned, about one trillion of finance will have to come from the private sector, domestic and international. At the moment on the international side, Compared to a target of about 500 billion a year, we are maybe mobilizing 20 to 25 billion. That's what the CPI numbers, that's what the OECD numbers show. So the scaling up of private finance, and it's not just about finance, it's about the institutional structures, the policy structures, and dealing with the risk issues, is perhaps the most important challenge in the scaling up of the financial agenda. Third, the role of multilateral development banks and development finance more broadly, you know, including local development institutions, will be absolutely crucial. The report that was prepared by Dr. Singh and Larry Summers, and, and I was part of the core team in the preparation of it, we show that there needs to be fundamental change in the role of multilateral banks. They need to become critical catalysts of transformative change not project by project anymore, but system change. They need to be you know, tremendously more effective in the mobilization of private finance, and they will need to work much better as a system and in partnership with others. As Martin said, that agenda has been totally now bought into by the leadership of these institutions. President Ajay Banga is very much in, in, in a, ahead of the curve now in taking it forward, but there's a lot still to be done. Finally, I want to point out about concessional finance. You know, we all, I come from the South, I come from India, we always complain that the rich countries are not doing the part. And indeed, the rich countries are not doing the part. But even if you double the amount of concessional finance that comes from the rich world, it will still amount to be, amount as a very small proportion of the total. So we have to be much more innovative about thinking about concessional finance and meeting the gap. We, in our report, highlight three possibilities. The first is carbon markets, and using carbon markets, including voluntary carbon markets, to generate resources predictably. Second, we believe that SDRs and SDR recycling can be quite a powerful impetus to the concessional finance agenda. And third, as the French financing pact has put on the table, international taxation, what I call taxing the bad to create resources for the good, like shipping, aviation, and other possibilities could be a powerful way of providing concessional resources. In closing, let me make two points. The agenda that we are talking about, and as the session that we opened with highlighted, Everybody has to do their part in this agenda. Individuals, communities, as the lifestyle for the environment has emphasized, businesses, governments at all levels, and crucially, crucially, private finance. 
So in that, and, and of course the donors and everybody else, in order to do this, we will have to rely now much more on platforms, country and sector platforms, regional platforms, global platforms, as a way of setting measurable outcomes, benchmarks, and accountability. That will be an extremely important, has to be a very important part of the architecture going forward. Last, this has been actually a quite productive year. As Minister Rodriguez said, we started with the Bridgetown Initiative, brought quite a lot of energy into this agenda. We had the Paris, uh, the new global financing pact coming out of Paris. There was a very big Africa climate uh, uh, finance summit with a very big impetus coming. We have had the UN put a lot of impetus. And all of this came together in a very important, I would call, the action agenda, the UAE uh, framework for climate finance, which was signed on to by 10 leaders, including Prime Minister Modi, President Biden, and several other you know, key leaders in the President Macron. And that agenda, which is very closely related to our report, will provide the kind of integrated framework that we need going ahead. So um, in, while I s highlighted some of the challenges, I just want to emphasize that the opportunity is there, and India can play a very, very crucial role, not just through the example of what Martin was talking about in pushing it here at home, but also in the international agenda, through the G20, through COP, and through all the international processes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, You know, at Terry, we, uh, uh, these events are terribly important to us because we get a sense of what is happening in the global space of the changes that you all as thought leaders are trying to encourage. We are also especially grateful for the philanthropy side because we work a lot on the ground trying to make things happen. So we're delighted that Priya Shankar, will you tell us a little bit from your perspective of as you see uh, climate and climate finance happening at the, whichever level you wish to talk about. Thank you. Um, and first of all, on behalf of Bloomberg Philanthropies, um, I'd like to congratulate Terry on its uh, 50th anniversary. Terry is a, a close partner of ours for our work here in India. And also like to thank uh, Dr. Vibhadhavan and the Terry team for convening us all together here at uh, this important World Sustainable Development Summit. Um, building on um, what uh, some of the previous speakers have said, we know that um, the, there's a massive kind of gap in climate finance. Um, 2023 was the, the hottest year on record. We feel the impact of climate change are already happening. And uh, the global stock take demonstrated that we need to rapidly advance progress. Um, at Bloomberg Philanthropies, our mission is to ensure uh, better and longer lives for the greatest number of people. And our work and focus on climate finance is critical to that as climate begins to sort of impact all aspects of people's lives. Um, in India, um, which has been really successful, building a bit on what Martin had talked about in um, attracting <coughs> renewable energy finance with its ambitious renewable energy target and uh, strong and robust Sorry. policy. Um, according to uh, Bloomberg NEF, it even came um, first in rankings for attractiveness in investment among emerging markets in 2023. Um, but even in India, which has been relatively successful, uh, there is a need for, for much, much greater investment. Um, again, according to uh, Bloomberg NEF, the net zero transition in India presents a $12.7 trillion investment opportunity. And in other um, emerging economies and markets, as Dr. Bhattacharya pointed out, the percentage of investment has been um, really lagging behind. Um, while we know that the challenge and the scale um, needed to drive this investment is immense, there are also huge opportunities. Um, according to research by the World Bank, we heard from Martin earlier, um, there is uh, a potential on average for every $1 invested towards the clean economy to generate sort of $4 in benefits. 
and it's that uh, potential of improvement that we're really seeking to unlock. And the majority of that investment will need to come uh, from the government and the private sector. Uh, but as philanthropy, uh, we can contribute by being um, nimble and catalytic. And building on uh, what Dr. Patitaria was talking about and his framing of gaps at, at Bloomberg Philanthropies, our work is really focused on trying to close three key gaps that we see in this. Founder Mike Bloomberg, UN Special Envoy for Climate and Ambition and a former mayor of New York City and the founder of Bloomberg LP, um, likes to say that you can't manage what you can't measure. And um, based on this, we've been supporting work to promote greater uh, data and transparency around financial markets and climate action through initiatives such as the Climate Data Steering Committee uh, and the Net Zero Data Public Utility, which we are co-convening together with the French government, uh, UNFCCC, and, and other organizations. Um, the second is around closing the action gap. Um, and as Dr. Bhattacharya pointed out, the role of private finance will be really critical for this action. Uh, Mike Bloomberg co-chairs the Glasgow Financial Alliance uh, for Net Zero, which brings together uh, private financial firms, now over 670 from 50 countries uh, committed to Net Zero. But we also recognize that there is a much stronger need to build capacity amongst uh, financial firms and institutions in uh, emerging economies and developing countries. And that's why together with the UN um, and other uh, multilateral and bilateral agencies, we launched a global capacity building coalition at COP28 focused on um, building capacities on climate finance in developing countries. Um, and then finally, coming to the kind of investment gap, which is the three, uh, the third sort of big gap that we see, uh, where we're trying to work uh, together with private sector, with uh, public um, agencies uh, to accelerate investment. Uh, I'd like to sort of highlight three examples. The first is uh, a joint initiative we have with the Asian Development Bank and Goldman Sachs called the Climate Innovation and Development Fund which has invested in programs both uh, here in India and in Vietnam around issues such as electric mobility and battery storage systems, as well as other clean energy technologies, trying to really uh, use uh, both the uh, philanthropic and um, development bank capital to attract and unleash much more sort of private sector investment into those areas and specific projects. Um, the second is the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative, which brings together private sector actors and has focused in India um, specifically on engaging Indian private sector and convening together with international private sector actors to encourage exchange of experiences in designing investments for climate projects in areas such as electric mobility, uh, green hydrogen, and municipal finance. And then finally, I would like to also uh, share about our partnership and pointing to India's leadership potential with the International Solar Alliance, where India has played such an important role in um, driving solar energy globally, where we're collaborating with the International Solar Alliance around mobilizing investment into solar energy amongst its member countries. Uh, building on um, what Dr. Bhattacharya said, I think um, outlining all the progress that was made last year, I would also like to add and highlight that a lot of this progress was um, driven uh, as well in the G20 by India's leadership during its um, G20 presidency and really thank the efforts of the Indian government and everyone who was involved in, in helping advance that. And also I would like to close by, I think, echoing Dr. Bhattacharya on the fact that we need really all kinds of investment and capital. We need more public finance. We need more private finance. Uh, we need um, the public sector and the private sector to kind of work together on innovative and blended mechanisms. Uh, but we also need support uh, from technical and research organizations such as Terry and other civil society actors to really ensure that climate is put at the heart of uh, financial systems and policy and markets, and it's done in a way that's uh, for the benefit of sustainable development and people. Um, thank you, and thank all my.
panelists as well for all the efforts that they're advancing uh, towards this from different angles. <coughs>
Now, the good thing is that we're now also bringing these efforts to India. We've been lucky enough to work with the Center for Responsible Business last year to run a number of capacity building pilots that were targeted at SME clusters, specifically in the textile and foundry industries, to really understand how we can adapt our approach to the specific needs of SMEs in India. We also have you know, content on the website that's now targeted at the Indian community, uh, case studies, uh, a specific landing page, and we'll be doing more in the months and years to come. So this is all to say that when it comes to SMEs and finance for SME climate action, it's actually important to recognize that we need to create a conducive ecosystem that doesn't only include financial support, but also other types of support in terms of you know, regulatory environment, but also capacity building. So we really need the likes of uh, governments, but also big business, financiers, capacity building organizations like the hub to come together to create this conducive ecosystem. So I hope that we're contributing, of course, uh, to this effort. And I would definitely call on you know, the SMEs who are present in this room, but also the other stakeholders who work uh, with SMEs to, to check out the hub. We know that there are 63 million SMEs in India, so we, we hope that we'll be able to uh, contribute to, to this effort in India. Thank you, Pamela. That's a hugely, hugely important topic for us. Uh, I can't tell you how important it is. Words are music to our ears that you're doing a lot of work. And uh, we are looking for the finance people to also find innovative ways to reach the SME sector. Dhruva, your turn. Please tell us what's going on from where you see the world changing on planet finance and sustainability. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Deepak. Thank you. And thank you, Terry and WSDS, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's always both hard and great to speak, be the last one speaking. And I'll just pick up, I'll, I'll try to be short and pick up from where Ahmad left in terms of ambition to action. Uh, CPI, as a climate finance pair, the numbers have already been quoted by Teresa, and thank you so much for referring to CPI's flagship work, which essentially year on year, it just, it's climate finance is growing, so is the gap growing. So is the gap growing? So is the SDG finance gap growing? So we are in a situation where the gap is going, growing. Even if investments are flowing, they're lower in developing countries. Let me just cut to chase as to where the root of the problem is and think of, think of, think aloud of uh, what is the action, uh, institutional action required. The point of private capital, which is coming out loud and clear all across. I've been on the wrong side of this discourse for the last 10 years from Paris, probably, on private capital not getting invested, not getting invested. And what we are trying is, you know, climate is a wicked problem, as it is called, because we are trying to manage a problem of stock by reducing flow, which is fine, uh, because that's the only technology you have. Can we look at finance in that perspective? Because if we look at finance in that perspective, and if we, if we look at the numbers, the G20 said 5.9 trillion, our previous report said 3.2, 3.3. You have the gaps everywhere, and the gaps are growing, and the gaps looks unbridgeable, at times impossible, in the given state of, and I refrain talking from India in this World Development Summit, and I'm talking about, is it possible for the world to mobilize that incremental, I'll refer to Amar's work, and, uh, the triple agenda report, which talks about the incremental investment rate. Is it possible that 3% investment? The question is, looks impossible. And what does it make it possible is to engage. Now, not look at income, not look at GDP, but look at capital. So here is the initiative of converting the thought from trying to look at what domestic mobilization, global mobilization, here is a role of transformative role of MDBs, and I'll, I'll soon come to that point in, for, the, for the transformative role and drawing up from the triple agenda, the Bridgetown agenda, but what is missing? And let me outline a few points of where I think the game changer needs to move. Because if the game changer remains at risk mitigation, leverage applied public finance, we are hearing that for the last 10 years, right? Is there a movement to engage capital 
And what, is, what do I mean by capital versus this? Is the engagement of, the world is a 10, 100 trillion economy. What is the amount of capital that rests in the institutional investor, sovereign investor pool? It's about 150 trillion. Now, if I'm trying to get this savings to investment happening under investment and trying to get this done, we will, it will not work and therefore capital needs to be engaged. And it just draws a certain reference to development and I'm kind of, kind of drawn to Piketty's book on capital in the 21st century that income possibly does not matter, capital and wealth does and so does, so does it for the global public good that the capital matters and we do not engage capital, neither the MDB system engages and I think there are strong references in the triple agenda and just to quote from there, bigger, bolder, better reforms that are required is to engage capital ex ante rather than ex post. What is the PCM calculation that is done downstream? This is direct, this is indirect, talk it. So one dollar of the bank goes and mobilizes X amount. It's almost like a multiplier of consumptions. Any further consumption is a private capital mobilization. It is not, there is a need to engage the private sector at, so even if Amar, it goes up to 390 billion of lending as the, the triple agenda talks about, there is this 390 billion Put all MDBs together, there is nothing that can happen with the size of balance sheets. And therefore, there is a need to start engaging capital institutionally at the start and not expect capital. Private capital will do its job, not expect capital. And I'll just make two more points which are important. Is the drawing from the triple agenda of financing global public goods, the institutional structure is missing and it needs three structures. Structure one, socialize cost of capital. Structure two, socialize information because it's a global public good and socialize technology transfer because again, it's a global public good. Thank you. Thank you, Dhruva. That's a great place where we end up. I want to uh, uh, give one opportunity to any burning question from the floor. Yes, please, lady here. Can we bring a mic? So while we're getting the mic, so uh, just uh, please, uh, do you have a mic? No. Come up. Do we have a mic? Just go ahead and ask the question. And being a poor student, well, I feel that what happens to the people at the bottom of the income pyramid? They just care about getting a house, getting a car. They don't care about the materials or the fuel it expands or it expands. Uh, so it's kind of like a sustainability is a rich people concept. How can we make it more affordable and more all people inclusive across the globe so that everybody needs to do their part, right? So what's your take on that and how can we make a sustainability all inclusive for Great. all income levels? Thank you. Great question. Any other burning question? Yes. One more, please. Right at the end. I'm sorry. We Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Sukhdeep uh, from DST Center for Policy Research, Punjab University. So I would like to do, because we have uh, uh, on technology transfer you talked about, um, I want to know that uh, uh, in, uh, in India, we did a, uh, conducted a study with the UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and we feel that at an institution level, technology transfer policy itself is not, has been, uh, you know, standardized. So in terms of when I'm going to for sustainability or climate finance and, uh, you know, bringing a private sector into that. Yeah, so I'm just coming into the crux of that, that what, what are your suggestions that how we should boost the technology transfer first and then how we can reduce the carbon footprint, sir? Okay, thank you. We are not going to be able to answer questions, uh, uh, the very broad questions. One is on how do we make sure that sustainability actually matters to people uh, who, are, uh, who, does, who are still a little bit distant from where we are. But let me uh, kind of pause uh, 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 
a quick sense from all of us here. Do we, do, uh, do you think, we, uh, you know, we the world capital markets is $400 trillion is the stock of financial capital. And therefore, small nudges can push the envelope quite easily to meet both uh, the gaps, various gaps that we're talking. My only sense at this point is to ask you the question, are you more optimistic today that we will get to where we need to be by 2030, both on inclusiveness finance, sustainable finance, as well as the mitigation finance? And just a hands up will be great. Are you optimistic? Yes. So you have the answer. Thank you all. We are done with this section. Thank you very much to the audience. A sincere thank you to all our esteemed speakers for their valuable contributions. Before we conclude, I'd like to invite our esteemed speakers to gather for a group photo, please. <laughs>